The first thing we have to understand when we're trying to break 100, we are not playing to par 72 golf courses, okay? That's for the professionals. Now, when we look at a golf course, we look at a par, uh, par 72, and we think that's what we're playing to. Well, that's true. But we don't try to shoot 72, we're trying to shoot 99. So 99 is plus 27, okay? So if we take plus 27 and split that up over the holes, on a golf course you have a scorecard that will tell you stroke index, the ranking of the holes from difficult to most difficult to least difficult, one being most, 18 being least difficult. So stroke index one to nine, are going to be the nine hardest holes and stroke index 10 to 18 are going to be the next most difficult but because we have 27 shots over par to play with we want to create a par 100 or par 99 golf course so that it can adjust your expectations your green and regulation and your strategy to make this game much simpler much less pressure and more enjoyable so that you can feel relaxed on the golf course so we call this par is a social construct and you create your own par. Because we have 27 strokes on the least difficult nine holes, the 10 to 18, we add one shot to par. On the most difficult nine holes, we add two shots to par. So every par three, if it's stroke one to nine, turns to a par five. A par four turns to par six, a par five turns to par seven. Stroke index 10 to 18, par 3 to par 4, par 4 goes to par 5, par 5 goes to par 6, and if you total up all those pars, the new total is going to be 99. So we're going to be playing a golf course with a par of 99. You can actually write this on your scorecard, just change the par in the, in the column. It normally says 5, 4, 3, 4, 4. Just change it. If you look at the stroke index here and just change that. 7, 6, 4, 5, 5. That's your new par. Your new par now informs your expectations. Why? Because you adjust your green and regulation. If we look at this green and regulation statistic on the PGA Tour for professionals and scratch golfers, for example, a par 72 golf course, what you do is you take two shots off the par. That is the green and regulation because of the expectation of two putts. So if you have a par 3, your green and regulation is 1. If you have a par 4, your green and regulation is 2. And a par 5, the green and regulation is 3. That's the expectation for scratch golfers. Remember, we are not scratch golfers. We are trying to break 100. So on your scorecard, you're going to find you're going to have par 7, par 6, par 5. Remember, green and regulation is expectation of two putts. Some people think it's unrealistic to two putt every hole. Well, I've got bad news for those people. You can. If you practice your putting, you reduce the three putts, you lose a lot of shots from your score. Beautiful. But now let's do the calculation and minus two from each of these to understand our green in regulation as break 100 players. Par five becomes a par seven if it's stroke index one to nine. You minus two from that, you minus two from the easier nine holes, and you'll get your new green in regulation. So you'll find that a par 3 in the stroke index 10 to 18 category will only require two shots to hit the green. Par 3s on the tees you're playing are probably not much longer than 175, 175 yards. Can you hit that green in two shots? Of course you can, of course you can. Par 4 change to par 5, minus 2 for the, for the green regulation is 3, and the green in regulation is 4 for a par 5. Imagine that par 5. Probably an easier one, let's say it's 500 yards. Can you hit four shots 500 yards? Of course you can, it's 125 per shot. Of course we're not going to hit 125 yard, 125 yard, 125 yard. But if you get your ball beyond that off the tee, beyond that on your second, at least you give yourself some room to take the pressure off. Now you're not trying to hit the par five like a professional in two strokes. If you're doing that at this handicap, chances are you're, you've done something really well and you're going to screw something up really bad. So take the pressure off. This one in the more difficult category, hole index, stroke index 1 to 9, the green regulation becomes 5 on a par 5, 4 on a par 4, and 3 on a par 3. Sometimes you get very difficult par 3s on golf courses. You only need to hit the green in 3 shots. 
bam, left of the green, boom, chip it on, two putt, you make a, you make a four, even if you three putt, you make a five. Perfect. If you can shoot those par numbers, you're gonna shoot 99. You might find, after watching this video, and I can almost guarantee it, the first time you break 100, you're gonna break it big time. You're gonna probably shoot a 95, 96, something like that. It's never a 98, 99 when you follow my system. Because of this new green and regulation, like I say, you don't have to have so much pressure to hit the greens, so your strategy changes. Now your strategy goes from trying to hit it as hard as you can all the time to try to play like a professional to actually going, hey, hang on, chill, bro, chill. You don't have to listen to your moron playing partners anymore trying to make you hit driver on a 310-yard hole when none of them can hit it 300 yards. Now you can just hang back and be like, I'll hit a seven iron in play. I'll get it up near the green in two shots. I'll chip it on and I'll take a two putt for a five. Bam. That becomes a par, f a par four changes to a par five. You get it on in three shots. You plus two putts. You might even chip and putt there for a par and that's a net birdie for you. That's what you're doing in this system, the beginning of the system. Very important part of the system is do not keep count of the score in your head as you play. Keep score, put it on the scorecard, write it down, only numbers, no circles, no triangles, no plus one, no plus two, no. You, you just write down, I made a five, I made a six, I made an eight, I made a two, I made a four. And then, do not keep count of it in your mind as you play. Do, you must never know how much you are over par at any one stage of the round, only at the end, of 18 holes, not the 18th tee, not the 17th tee, after you've got the ball in the hole, on the final hole, you tally up the score, and I'm sure you're gonna find, you're gonna break 100, probably 95, 96. I'll give you, if you do this system, I'm gonna tell you, maybe five or six rounds, you're under 100. Anyone can do it. Let's get into the meat and potatoes, the non-negotiables on how to break 100. These are without a doubt 100% non-negotiable. I won't argue or talk about them any more than this. If you listen to this, you will break 100. For your tea club, you need the longest, most reliable club that you have in your bag. If that is a five wood, a four iron, a hybrid, a seven iron, I don't care what it is. You have to pick a club that's gonna get you in play, not in hazards, reliably. That may be a high lofted club. It's up to you. But the longest, most reliable club. Not one that's gonna go OB or in the water. Then you need to have, really important, is a go-to backup club of the T. So if you've chosen your longest, most reliable club is a seven iron, is your eight iron the backup? It could be. But some days that club's not gonna work and you need to change gears and go to the club that's just gonna get you in play every time because we have to avoid penalties. No OB, no water, which is very important that you play away from the trouble. You play away from the trouble. When there's a bunker, when there's water, when there's OB, you play away from it. And that can often mean taking your shot shape into account. So if you fade it and you've got OB on the left, that's fine, just hit it there and let, let it fade to the right. But if you've, got, if you've got OB on the right and you fade it that way, you better aim it out further left, but if your fade is too big that it goes OB, it's time to take another club that doesn't fade as much. When there's water, we wanna stay short of it. When there's water on the right, we wanna play left. It's okay to play it on another fairway, on another hole, or in the trees. Just stay dry, don't get in the water. We have to play away from all trouble. That also includes bunkers. If there's a big bunk on the left side of the fairway and you fade it, try play a shot that's going to either not reach the bunker or fade away from the bunker into a safe place. If that's not possible, your only option is to play short of the bunker. Remember, we only have to hit these greens in like two, three, four, five shots, depending on the par. So you don't always have to bomb it a long way, which is actually probably part of your, pro your problem is that you're trying to bomb it and hit the driver as hard as you can all the time. In this system, you're not allowed to do that. You should never be smashing a single shot in this system. Once you've figured out your most reliable club, it's completely up to you, but you have to be honest with yourself. Is it as reliable as you say? Now I've written phantom shot. Yeah, a phantom shot is what everyone who's breaking 90 and 100 like to do. They like to aim for the phantom straight shot. It's not coming. 
you don't hit a straight shot regularly. If you did, if your standard shot was a dead straight shot, you would not be looking at this video on how to break 100. You have a shot shape. It may be left and right. It may be predominantly left, maybe predominantly right, but you need to start to find what your shot shape is. And this phantom shot never comes. From the tee, we've got these two clubs, and whatever this club is, is whatever it is. If your driver is really good as it is, hey, well done, I'm, I'm very happy for you. I'm not banning driver. I would recommend that you take the driver out if it's your big problem club and work on it away from the course. If you insist on having a driver, I would recommend anyone trying to break 100 should not have any lower loft than 11 to 13 degree driver. Anything lower than that, I think you're wasting your time. There's so many problems in a swing as a beginner, so many fundamental things going on and confidence is not high enough that I don't believe you should have a lower loft than 11 to 13 degrees. Now you can get a mini driver. Now a mini driver, absolutely beautiful. You can pick them up secondhand everywhere. The next thing you want to have is a 150 yard club. You can't break 100 without at least 150 yards. So this 150 yard club can actually be your longest, most reliable club to get off the tee. It can be, and that's okay. But you definitely need 150 yards to be able to reach 400 yard holes in three shots, to be able to reach 300, yards, 300 yard holes in two shots to allow a pitch shot or a chip shot. You really can't play great golf if you can't hit it 150 yards. So if you cannot get a ball 150 yards to go relatively in a sort of range of where you need it to go, you need to go get a lesson at a professional to be able to hit the shot at least. You're welcome to fill the gap with something reliable between 150 yard and a pitching wedge, but I recommend you get yourself a pitching wedge and a sand wedge. So you could do a T club if it's a separate one. You could do a 150 yard shot and a pitching wedge, a sand wedge, and your putter, and you've got five clubs, you can break 100. You don't even need a full bag of golf clubs. I know you're not gonna do that, but if you wanna test me, go play with five clubs, and I'll bet you, your score is either exactly the same or a few shots better. The pitching wedge and the sand wedge, why do I ask for that? Well, the 150 yard club can often be used as a chipping club around the green to keep it very low and running, but mostly, I want you to use the pitching wedge and the sand wedge and get to know the distances they go. The key fundamental to golf at every level is to understand how far you hit your ball. So if you know your carry distance with the 150 yard club being whatever it is, then you can start to work out what the other club should carry and work your way to a pitching wedge to understand the distance it carries on a full shot and a half shot. Sand wedge, full shot and a half shot, the same swing the half shot goes with a pitching wedge and a sand wedge. So you're gonna have a full distance, let's say it's 90 yards with a pitching and 70 yards with a sand wedge. That's full swing. Now you create another swing, half swing, nine to three, nine to three on the, on the clock face. I mean, I, I don't know if I have to explain that, but there, there's, nine, there's nine, there's three. So you're swinging there and then you're swinging back, okay? Or whatever. Now that swing, you can use with both these clubs. When you use it with both these clubs, you get a like a 50% feeling swing. And that could make a pitching wedge come down to 60 and your sand wedge could come down to 40. Now you have one, two, three, four distances in your repertoire to bring out to be able to play inside the 100 yard range. This is the key to playing best, your best golf. You want to keep the ball in play away from trouble. You want to get it greenside. You want to chip with these clubs and you want to pitch with these clubs. And as you get to know your distances with these clubs, you know where you can lay the ball up to, to allow an easy pitch shot or to allow an easy approach shot. So when you're splitting that hole up, as we, as we saw when we changed the green and regulation, you start to understand, oh, today I feel like hitting a 70 yard sandwich into the green or 60 yard half pitching wedge or 40 yard half sandwich, up to you. Once you know those things, these shots here are gonna serve you until you're trying to break 80, until you're trying to break 80. This is gonna be your go-to club for the rest of your golfing career. This club is gonna be the one you love. These two clubs are gonna be your go-to for the short game, for pitching, for approach shots, for chipping, for sand shots. Now, if you use these clubs, and you play away from trouble, 
and you use your shot shape. You don't play phantom shots, these you know, amazing straight shots. That's already a good start. Let's move on to more non-negotiables so that you can get even better. Next non-negotiables is the game inside 120 yards, inside pitching wedge range. This is the key to playing golf. Now, I'm not going to finesse you and try to sell you something where you're going to use data and things like that. You're going to get people who are going to talk about this stuff. At breaking 100 level, we don't need to focus on nonsense. We need to focus on practicalities. We need to focus on what you can do right now to lower your score, get you under 100, break the barrier. What you'll find is a lot of people talking about nonsense like strokes gained and being further off the tee is better all the time, etc., etc. Now, there's some validity to that when you become a good player. If you're having trouble off the tee, the longer you go off the tee, the further it goes out of bounds. The higher loft you hit off the tee, the less dispersion you have left or right. This is the science of golf. It's a science and an art. So while people are telling you you have to get it as close to the green as possible, you have to hit driver and hit as far off the tee as possible, not now, not now, okay? You'll have plenty more time to argue with the idiots, okay? For now, I don't want you arguing with anyone. I want you playing your game. I want you playing this game. I want you under 100 right now because then you can watch my Breaking 90 video and get under 90. If you've done those previous things I talked about with the backbone of your bag, having the tee club, the 150-yard club, the pitching, the sand, the putter, and that one swing, half swing, with both the pitching and the sand wedge, you're going to start to have an arsenal of shots to be able to set yourself up comfy shots. You want to hit your comfy distances into greens. Golf is a game of confidence. Anyone playing this game on a paper, on a data spreadsheet, you're not playing on a spreadsheet. You're playing with confidence, confidence and emotions. We're playing with plans. We're playing with processes to get us in the frame of mind so when we're playing, we don't get distracted by nonsense. We have to be more mindful, we have to be understand our own game, we have to understand how we play and where we feel most comfortable. As you get more comfort hitting shots you like, you start to build confidence to create more shots that you may like and feel comfortable with. In the beginning, you're gonna have four or five shots you might feel comfortable with, and then for me, I'm playing with a two or three handicap, you might find I have 30 or 40 different comfortable shots. But really, the backbone of my comfortable shots came from when I was trying to break 100 and break 90. They stay with you forever. Focus on the core, focus on the process, and we'll get there. I've played with plenty of people trying to break 100. Very few can do a great pitch shot with a partial wedge. If you work on them, you can, and then you can start hitting it closer to the green. Before that, it's best to just hit your comfy, confident building clubs to build more confidence. Let's move on to pitching. Now, pitching is a bit longer. Chipping is mainly around the green, something you can get onto the green rolling quickly. A pitching shot may be something further out from 30, 40, 50, 60 yards. My number one thing for anyone trying to break 100 is no 60 degree wedge. Just don't buy one, don't use it. It's a very specialty club. Even the professional golfers only use these clubs in very select conditions and will often be using them for specialty shots not that many prefer to use a 60 all the time, and that's a professional. So if you're trying to break 100 and you've got a 60 degree, okay, maybe you're part of the 1% who can hit the 60 degree at the breaking 100 level, but you're probably part of the 99%, and there's nothing wrong with that. We all were. We all were. You can get one of those things when you need them, because at this stage, you don't need it. And that thing's going to cost you a lot of shots. Duffs, blades, thins, you need to know what grind you need. You need to know what bounce you need for a 60 degree wedge. Nah, -uh. We're going to take pitching. We're going to use those two clubs we talked about, the pitching wedge and the sand wedge. We're going to create one half swing and two distances with each club. So you're going to have a pitching wedge and a sand wedge is going to both have a 50% distance and you're going to start using that to ghiottige. Now this ghiottige is an Italian word, very famous Italian word on this channel. And I'm moving to Italy in June 2023, where I can fully embrace the ghiottige. What does it mean? Get it on the green. A very simple concept, yeah, very mundane, very inane, but key. Because when you're standing there in your emotional state, pressure state, putting so much 
pressure on yourself, thinking that you need to do something, go back to when you're in a tough situation, just get it on the green. Why do I say get it on the green? Because sometimes we get greedy and we try to hit a professional level flop shot and we leave it in a bunker. It's now a fried egg liner bunker and we are scared of the bunkers and we're going to now take four shots to get out of a bunker instead of pitching it over the, over the flag, let it roll out five or ten yards and leave yourself the putt. You can always make a putt. It's very difficult to make a chip shot. So you pitch on the green to allow a putt. Focus on Giotege. Giotege. When we talk about chipping, this is, these are the areas you're going to take off the most shots in your score. Okay? The beginning part was strategy and you'll learn that. But the, this area here is just where the strokes start getting shaved one after the other. Listen, my mans, if you can do what I told you before, get good at this, like really good, you're probably going to get down to like a 10 handicap. The world average is 15. If everyone plateaus at 8 to 10 handicap using my systems, I'm very happy boy. Because if everyone plays to 8 handicap, what the hell? Now, okay, now you can nip tuck on the fancy stuff. This is the real deal. Chipping. Key. Chipping's difficult. You need to eliminate the double chips. You know what it's like. You got that chip and you just stab it into the ground, teeth it across the green because you're so nervous. And I understand it because there are ways to chip very easily, but sometimes the concept just doesn't come real easy. The easiest swing in golf for me is the putting, the putting swing, the pendulum. You can use the exact same thing for your chipping. Did you know that? I'd like to tell you how. Take one club for chipping. You only, you only play with one club at this stage. You don't go chipping with four or five different clubs depending on the situation. Of course, if it's a high lofted club needed or something like that, you can use your sand wedge. But take your one club. I would recommend your pitching wedge or your nine iron if you've selected it in your bag. It's very tough. Sometimes you're not sure of the technique. Very easy technique, very easy. I like the putting pendulum stroke. So all you do is do a bit of toe down chipping. Now, what do I mean by toe down chipping? Normally you chip with your hands a bit lower. What you can do is pick the grip up like you're gonna have a putt so that the club, the club head sits square like this, but then as you pick it up from the shaft here, it does this, and the toe is sitting on the ground, and the heel is sitting up, and you can putting pendulum chip it, and that's gonna make chipping much easier for you. Give it a try. But the key you want to understand with this is that there is rollout. A lot of new players or people trying to break 100 don't understand that there's a rollout. When you hit a chip, you don't want to be flying it at the hole. If you fly it at the hole, you're going to careen off the green. You're going to be having chips back, or you're going to leave yourself 60-foot putts back to chip. Remember, when you chip, you have to land it on the green and let it roll out. So what you do is you find yourself a place to land it on the green, and then anticipate the rollout. Then, from anticipating the rollout, you can read the green like a putt. Left or right, right or left, whichever way it goes. I've seen a lot of break 100 players, because I play with a lot of them, fly the ball all the way to the hole. It doesn't really work. The other reason I say use a pitching wedge for your one chipping club, the higher lofted clubs are really difficult to gauge the spin. They're really difficult to gauge the strike with the turf. These lower lofted clubs allow you a lot more error and still have a good shot. So you could thin it a little bit, you could chunk it a little bit, and it's still going to get on the green. Remember? Giotzeke, get it on the green. But when you're using high lofted clubs, you can screw them up a lot easier by the, the bottom of the club bouncing into the ground, digging into the ground. These lower lofted, very easy. You can even flick it with your wrist sometimes. It's still going to work out. Putting. Now, putting is a very serious problem for higher handicapped players or trying to break 100 players. Why is that? Because they don't get, and you may not, may not get this, very key thing. It's just the speed. All you need is speed control for putting. And when I mean speed control, I mean understand when it's downhill, understand when it's uphill. Downhill, the putt's gonna be faster, so you have to find a way of getting the ball to the hole to stop at the hole instead of shooting 12, 13 foot past anymore because it's not flat, okay? If it's downhill, you have two options. You can either look at an imaginary hole before the cup and putt to that as if that was the hole on a flat putt. 
So if you're downhill and the hole's here and you're up here, you could imagine the cup's here and hit this pace as if it were a flat putt. That's going to mean it will die here and just trickle to the hole. The other option is to hit the same normal putt you do on a flat on a flat putt of the same distance, but just hit it out the toe of the club. What do I mean by that? So if you've got a putter here, okay, and you normally strike the ball in the center of the face, just do the exact same stroke, but strike it off the toe here. That sounds funny, but there's no sweet spot on the toe. So when you putt it, it's going to kill the speed already because it's not going to have the same zip from the sweet spot. Now when I say speed is key, what I mean by that is that you have a general idea of the line. Most people do, they can feel the slope. Often you may not get it on the more subtle ones, but most of the time you're trying to two putt. So if you're trying to two putt, you just need to stop that damn ball as close to the hole as you can. You don't need to be jamming everything. You just need two putts of a green, and if you're inside three feet, you want to make as many as you can. But this over here is all about speed. Focus on getting that ball to stop within six inches of that cup to a foot, just to leave yourself an easy putt. You'll eventually start to narrow your reading down to get more accurate reads and you'll start to understand how the ball shapes on the greens and how it goes across the hole, behind the hole, lips out. Those will come with time. You don't need that now. You just need to understand speed and getting it to stop in line with the hole. If you can do that, you're going to save so many strokes. Number one thing I see with higher handicappers is not understanding uphill and downhill is not then understanding once you've hit it past the hole downhill, you've now got an uphill putt, so you need to hit it firmer. They get freaked from the downhill putt, so they leave the return putt short. So if you understand the difference between uphill and downhill putts, it's going to make a big difference to your game. You can use these two techniques. For flat putts, just always try to get it in line with the hole at least. When people say you've got to get it past the hole and you know a putt that a putt that's short never goes in, you know what? If you give me uh, a break 100 player who's hitting the greens in regulation that we have just set up and you said this guy can have every single putt eight inches short of the cup I'd buy that every single round I would buy those putts because it means he's just got little tap-ins to make two putts that's all we need start at one foot this is the basis of the way of the player and how you're gonna get better at golf throughout your career all the way to breaking 80 then the game starts from the cup why do I say start at one foot? Well, the reason is, you go practice putting from 10 feet, 15 feet. You've heard someone say, you need to make more 10 footers. You need to make more 15 footers. Blah, 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 blah. Professionals on the PGA Tour make 50% of their eight footers, about 40% of their 10 footers, and maybe 25 to 30% of their 15 footers. So forget about that. The main thing we need to do, remember, we need to hit comfy shots to build confidence. With putting, there's no point in practicing missing. There's no point in practicing missing your putts unless you're going for speed control, but then I don't want you putting to a hole. Putt to a tee. Putt to a very small thing so you don't start associating missing with the putt. One foot putts are unmissable. They're unmissable if you practice them. So what I would suggest as a break 100 player and someone trying to get better is to start with one foot putts. You heard that correct. One foot. What is a foot? It's about 30 centimeters. It's probably about like that long, the length of a grip on a, on, a, on a putter. So stick that ball, the length of your putter grip, away from the hole, put it in the hole. Pick it out the hole, put it down, do it again. Pick it out the hole, do it again. Have five or six balls there, hit them from one foot into the cup until it's full, take the balls out, keep doing it. Make 50 of those in a row. Make 100 of those in a row. Only people who do this will understand what begins to happen. Many people will say, that's stupid. Believe me, go try to do that. Firstly, you're going to start concentrating. You're going to start to understand your tendencies. You're going to start to understand your weakness in your mind and how you start to see things. And eventually, you're going to overcome that and you're going to start to see the ball in a line. You're going to see, start to see like a little trough, a little line of where the ball is going to travel. Do the one foot putts. You, you're going to make more. You're going to hear the sound of the ball going in the cup. That is key to putts. We want to hear the ball going in the hole. We don't want to watch the ball missing. We want to hear that ball rattle in the hole. Do that. One foot putts. Listen. Start to, start to convince your brain that you make putts. Start to get that good feeling from the sound of that putt. That's going to get you on a good path to being 
the player you were meant to be. Now look, we've got these rescue shots, okay? Well, you're gonna get in a bunker. And one of the big, big problems with break 100 players, and I've seen it a lot, is people just pick the ball up and just move to the next hole because they've given up on the hole because they can't get it out of a bunker in one shot, in two shots, sometimes three. Sometimes they can't get out. You need to understand how to get out the bunker in one shot. I, I've got many videos on this and maybe I'll attach one right now. Roll the tape. You're not hitting the ball, no chipping, okay? That chipping thing ha happens where you hit the ball and it scurries up and stays in the bunker or you're chipping it over the green or you're fluffing it. It doesn't work as reliably. Now, if you don't accelerate through the ball, basically no bunker technique is going to help you. Here's a line behind the ball. We're taking it out on this pocket of sand like this, okay? We're not hitting the ball. We're going un go entering there. We're going under and entering, exiting after the ball like that. We open the face, let the club face sit open, grab the club while it's open, okay? Grab the club while it's open. Put the ball a bit further forward in your stance so your hands are behind the club head. And the most important is to slap the sand with the sole of the club. Slap it hard. Slap that hard and use your wrists to slap it. So, you know, you don't have to initially practice this like this. Just take it and come to empty sand and slap it. You, you have to get confident at that action so that you can do it when the ball's there. So we want to enter just behind the ball, we open up the face and we just slap that sand with the sole of the club. So this works the best for most people but most people don't accelerate because they are scared of teething it. So practice without a ball. Even on the course, I mean the social round, just if someone gives you trouble just tell them listen bro I'm not on the fucking PGA Tour, I'm learning. And then we're gonna slap the sole behind the ball Take it out on a magic pocket, magic carpet ride. Do you see that? GTFO from the bunker, get it on the green, hold the green. No chipping, no teething it across the green, no keeping it in a bunkers, just getting it out in one. And then leave it, just maintain that skill. You don't need to get so good that you're getting up and down all the time. Letting that ball come out on a magic carpet ride. That's why it's called a splash shot. But the key you have to understand is you're not hitting the sand. You're trying to hit the sand before the ball and the club's gonna bounce off the sand and go underneath the ball and scoop it out on a magic carpet of sand. I'll put the video in, a punch shot. I'll, tr I'll put the punch shot video in as well. The punch shot is key to golf. Like it's, yeah, at the bottom, but this may be the most important takeaway of this video. You need to develop a punch shot. A punch shot is merely a longer chip shot with a low lofted club. So instead of chipping with your pitching wedge, your sand wedge, you've now got your six iron in hand or your hybrid in hand and you're just chipping the ball to go under trees when you're in the, in the bad stuff just to advance the ball toward the hole or sideways out of the trouble. This, this, this shot over here can, if you learn it and get the ball to be able to roll out and, and set up another shot in instead of staying in the trees, you could be setting up yourself an easy way to shave five to six shots in a round, sometimes 10 shots in a round, just by not hitting dunderhead shots. A punch shot, very powerful. Mindset, grind set. I like the hustle culture on the internet, you know, the gratitude journals and things like that. <laughs> Listen, quick stuff. Stick to your plan, monkey boy. You've got to have the right mindset to break 100. If you've got a plan, monkey man, stick to the plan. If you have one bad blow up hole, it doesn't mean the end of the plan. You go, oh, Matt's talking crap. I'm just gonna FOMO and I'm gonna YOLO out of this and hit my driver all over the place and take a 10 and then blame him. If you want to make this fail, that's the first step to make it fail. To not stick to the plan and go FOMO and hit crap shots. Because now the plan doesn't work because you had one bad hole. You will have bad holes. It's gonna happen. Do not let it affect you because you're not counting your score and on top of it you have plenty of holes left. Not every hole is going to go like your bad hole. The next shot could be the best shot of your life. On this system you never ever smash a golf ball. If you smash a golf ball you've done this wrong and you need to write out 10 Hail Marys or Hail Mats. Never smash because you have to break the holes up into such small fragments you should never be in a situation where you have to smash a shot. 
this understanding and that ability to not smash is going to serve you in future golf where you realize good tempo and good uh, relaxed swings instead of the tension filled smashes are going to get you more distance and more comfort and more confidence. This is a big one. A lot of people who try to break 100, even 90, bring in the self-deprecating humor. It's lame. I mean, I hate to break it to you, but stop doing this because this one not only doesn't make your partners, act, they don't laugh with you. Like, it's not funny, right? Like when you say, oh, well, I'm playing well after six holes and the wheels will come off. This always happens. The wheels always come. Yeah, come the wheels are coming off, whatever you say. No, cut that out of your vocabulary. Your playing partners don't respect you anymore by doing that. Um, and it actually, you know, makes them think less of you. And on top of that, you are creating a situation in your own mind where you have just told yourself that's going to happen. You've just told yourself. I'm not one of these woo-woo people who believes in funny things, but there's something very real in golf where if you say the words, it will happen. If you say it enough times, it's going to happen. If you set yourself up for a negative situation, it's going to happen because you've already set the wheels in motion to create bad things. Your, your thinking starts changing, your strategy starts changing, your tension increases. Look at the better side of things, look at the more positive side of things, and just enjoy the moment that you're playing well. Understand, yes, something's going to happen, but it doesn't mean that the wheels completely come off. A self-deprecating humor is okay in a certain situation, but don't use it to try and defend yourself against the impending doom you're creating for yourself because you have buyer's remorse. You want to set up a good delusion. Set up a good one. In fact, see yourself as a 90 breaker. Imagine yourself. Be somebody else. I'm whatever your friend's name is, Herbert or Pubert, whatever his name is, and I shoot 85. I'm a 90 breaker. That alone, just the difference in mindset versus someone who's saying that the, the wheels are going to fall off, they always do this, oh, here come, the, here come the, 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 the double pars, whatever it is they say. Forget about that. Set yourself up an, a delusion that assists you and aids you in playing better, more fun golf. And I suggest seeing yourself as a 90 breaker. This is one only really for legends, okay, because I do this. And this is how I shot 67. It's how I made a hole in one. It's how I did most things. There's even in one of the books I used to write a lot of stuff in, there's even a house I drew five years, six years before, and I only drew it twice. And it had exactly the setup I like, and the car in a certain place, and the dog in a certain place in the picture, and the layout, and four or five years after that, it happened. I was st staying in the house I had drawn with the dog, with the car where it is, I only found that out when I went back home to the other house that I realized that in the book that picture was there. So this is only really for people who are willing and are legends. Write it down. Write down your goal. I, Matt, will break 100. I, Matt, will shoot 99. I, Matt, will shoot 89. Whatever you want your insane goal to be, write it down every day 15 times without fail. If you do that, writing it down 15 times every single day, you're going to break 100. Maybe if you just do that, that's pretty much the whole video. If you just do that, you're probably going to do it. YouTube mechanics is useless. So you as a high handicap or someone trying to break 100, you don't know the first thing about swing mechanics. You've watched some video and you regurgitated what somebody may have said. Yes, Mike Malask is a very clever guy. But he's still not going to just give generic advice to a guy on the range. He's going to look at his biomechanics, how he moves, his understanding of the golf swing, his learning style, and he's going to give him advice. Following YouTube mechanics is utterly useless because, number one, you are reacting to a ball flight, but you don't know what's happening in your swing, in your hips, in your knees, in your, in your stance, in your grip, that's causing that ball flight. There's a very root cause to everything in a golf swing. And by you going to YouTube to look up from the ball flight, you're getting the wrong fix. So you're getting a fix to a problem you probably don't have. So you've got a wrong diagnosis on your part because of the ball flight. You've got a wrong fix from some grifter on YouTube who's trying to sell you something. And then you're going to go and implement that fix incorrectly. Why do I say that? Because you're not recording yourself. 
you, you're not recording yourself down the line and, and front on to see the changes you're making. So you're getting a band-aid from a wrong solution to a wrong problem and now you've got some residue building up in your golf swing and you start to see that that tip doesn't work anymore. Now you try another tip, but you've still got residue from that other thing you were doing from that other guy. Now you've watched a hundred different YouTube people and they've told you all different ways to fix your slice and now you slice it worse and you want to give up. If you're, going to, if you're going to get interested in fixing your swing, and I highly recommend you do as somebody new to the game or trying to break 100, get to a coach ASAP. Those guys are going to fix you up like this. Instead of taking three or four years of this nonsense to lose all hope and then slowly rebuild it and then eventually get to a coach, leapfrog that three or four years and get to the coach now. That's going to be probably, after this, that's probably the second best tip in the whole video. Remember, to break 100, you are a player, not a range hitter. A range hitting is the long drive guys. It's the guys who like to go hit like four buckets a day. And then when they get to the golf course, they score like crap, okay? You are a player, not a range hitter. You're not gonna go there, stand at the range and just scrape and hit, scrape and hit, scrape and hit. Every time you scrape and hit a shot, you're, you're building a memory in your body about scraping and hitting with no idea where the ball is going, no intent, nothing. When you get to a golf course, what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to look down the fairway and go, oh shit, I don't know where this ball is going. So forget about the range hitting unless you have something to work on with your coach or unless that range is made of grass and you are playing an imaginary course in your mind using the things on the range to create a course and aim points and things like that. You can do that on a range with grass or a range with mats if there's none, none with grass. But if you're going to the range, there's only two occasions. You're playing a course in your mind or you have something to work on with your coach and he's helping you. Other than that, you're learning on the golf course. Learn on the golf course. Learn how to score. Use what I've told you and score. This game is about scoring, not about impressing your friends with the 310-yard drive out of bounds into someone's house. It's not impressive. It's, it's idiotic. So get better at scoring. Get better at strategizing, planning being in control of your emotions, you're going to be the go-to partner in every better ball competition. That's who I like. I don't like the guy with no brain. I like the guy thinking, strategizing, accepting who he is, understanding his distances, enjoying the day, no self-deprecating humor, no nonsense about him being useless. We like confidence. We like, we like people who get it, who, who score, people who are players. You're a player. You're not one of these guys. A little hack I've picked up along the years, use cheaper golf balls so that when you're playing, you're not stressed about losing a two, three, four, five dollar golf ball. Just go play secondhand golf balls, not refurbished, just secondhand golf balls. You can use cheap ones, you can use urethane, Kirkland, or if you want Serlin golf balls, the standard hard ball, just use anything. It doesn't matter at this stage. I just don't want you stressed over losing balls because then you get more tense and you lose more balls and you end up hitting all over the show taking penalties. Now, this is a key right here. This is where the data nerds, and listen, I'm a data nerd. I, 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 I can analyze data, and I did in a, in a former life as, as part of my job, to be able to transform data into stuff that people can use, and I know 99% of people can't read data. But there's no data that can tell you when you're hitting the ball as far as you can all the time, as close to the green as you can all the time, and you're a high handicapper trying to break 100, you're looking for freaking balls all the time. It is nothing more debilitating in the world of golf than having to look in the long grass for golf balls every hole. Am I right? I mean, I know when I've got two holes in a row and I've hit it into the rough and I have to go and I search through long grass to go find the ball, and then I start imagining, oh, now I'm gonna go walk back to the tee, and then I'm gonna hold the whole group up, nothing worse. Nothing worse. So use the system to stay away from trouble, stay in play, watch your ball intently, and be conscious all the time. This compounds. Everything compounds in golf. This feeling compounds. Let's avoid this feeling by keeping that ball in play in good situations with comfortable shots. When you've hit a bad one, a lot of people will be incredulous when they high hand, oh, I can't believe I hit that shot. Oh, I've seen it, I've seen it. I've seen a guy duff a chip, and then he duffed a second, and he duffed a third, 
all within the space of two yards. And he just stood there and he dropped his club and his hat. And, and I was like, dude, that's your fourth, fifth and sixth shot on this par three. Like, get a move on. Did the ball go forward? Yes. Is it still in play? Yes. Good. <laughs> it's good. If the ball's gone forward, it's in play, closer to the hole, next shot, done, done. No reminiscing, no commiserations, get it done. A couple quick hacks for you players. You want to break 100, play the same course over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. 10 times, 20 times in a row, you'll probably break 100 there. Next hack I have is if you can make that course a par 70, often that can be to your advantage. Uh, you just make it a par 97 or even a par 99 if you want to by adding uh, stroke 1 to, what would that be, 1 to 11. So that would be 22 over and then you would go with uh, stroke 12 to 18 being uh, sing just bogeys. So you can add two shots to hole to stroke index 1 to 11 and one shot to hole 12 to 18 to create a par 99 which is going to be 29 over par which gives you two extra shots compared to a par 72. That's how I did it on breaking 100, breaking 90 and but breaking 80 I broke on a par 72. But 190 I broke on par 70 golf courses. Does it count? Of course it counts. Does it count on a par 69? Nah. Must be 70 or above, in my opinion. One more little hack, little mindset grind set. Put out everything if it's not going to hold up play. Learn to make your one foot putts, your two foot putts. If you keep taking gimmies, the days that comes when they're going to start counting to get under 90 or under 80 in a competition or something, you're going to regret taking gimmies all the time. So in this early stage of your game, and you're doing the one foot drill, on the course, just, just go and finish your putts. Just do it for your own sake, for future. It can get very easy to start taking putts and when you're in a tournament now you're facing, you're facing a putt or, or in a competition against someone, you're facing a putt that you don't normally see, you don't know what to do. So hold those putts out on the golf course and you're gonna be the player you were meant to be.